Hey there, welcome back to the podcast. Hope you're doing well. It is about 6 o'clock the end of a day here, and I am driving home from work on a hot summer feeling day. Almost 90 degrees here. Um, man, where did spring go? I feel like I was just recording um, episodes where I was saying, oh, it's finally starting to feel like spring. <laughs> oh my goodness, time flies. Well, I've been quite serious um, in the few things that I have posted and more so just um, in every waking moment of my life lately. <laughs> um, had an awesome opportunity last night to share with our small small fellowship what I've been looking at for the last couple of weeks um, in Second Chronicles about the life of King Hezekiah. And I'm telling you, I am stoked about recording that in maybe more fullness and greater in depth um, for some upcoming podcast recordings. I'm I'm literally excited about setting time aside for that. Hopefully, this upcoming weekend. I shared with a friend of mine just in brief um, in a phone call as I headed out this morning about it. And I'm telling you, it's just it's the story. It's our story. It's it's the story of the people of God. Just encapsulated in. Just really in light of the scriptures. Now, now Zechariah gets a lot of attention in the scriptures, especially when you look at the kings that are throughout history, biblical history, and the timeline of what we're told about, about the reign of specific kings, whether it's Israel or Judah or or wherever. He gets a good amount of space. Um, But still, of course, in the light of the entire scriptures, it's very minimal um, text. But within it is a wealth of information um, for those of us, hopefully like yourself, that are really giving, giving ourselves to discovering what it means to be the people of God. How do we do that? I mean, and, and really sitting back and asking ourselves, are we sure that we are the people of God? Because I, as I touch on, I feel like with great regularity... Is is are we comf- are we comfortable enough? Are we secure enough to to kind of lay ourselves bare before God and ask Him tough questions that that really we must answer and one day we will. So I would prefer to begin to answer these now and endeavor further into my response to those questions, whatever answer may come, I should say, specifically, and start giving myself to that now. Otherwise, I'm just kind of plugging my ears and and covering my eyes and saying, oh, God, don't look at me. (laughs) You know, like, I don't know if your children did this when they're younger, should you have older children now, or if you have younger children now that presently do it as I do. But, you know, there's a shame in in disobedience and rebellion, you know, that often often shows itself even in in the response of a of a physical body. Um you know it, it demonstrates itself even in body language. And often in my nearing eight year old you know, he'll turn away from me. And I mean, even that, I'm not some super spiritual Superman, but I don't know. It's just how I'm wired. A lot of things that are very common, I just really, I don't know. They just land somewhere in me and I see the spiritual principle within the simple natural act, such as that. It's like, I see him do that to me. And of course, there's this, there's this large compartment of me that sees it completely in the natural, as a daddy, as a father of a young son. But I feel like equally so, I I look at that and I say, God, that's me. Lord, that's me. That's how I am. That's how your people are. That is how we are, is we're, we're caught in our shame. Or rather, we're caught in our disobedience. We're caught in our rebellion. We're caught in our hardness of heart. And, you know, we when we're caught, we could say we have... 
when it's exposed, you know, caught kind of brings connotations that maybe I'm not trying to insinuate. I'm not talking about God saying, aha, I caught you in your error and ways of deception and deceit. It's not that. Caught as in, you know, light has shined upon a hidden thing. Right? I mean, light, light has come into a dark place in me. And when I see my son do that or any other child that's in the sphere of my life, I'm like, that's how, that's how we are. And like, really, and I don't want to go into that, and this is how every one of these recordings seem to go. It's like, okay, should I just talk about that? Should I just talk about that, that being right now in this moment? Like, that's why we rear our children the way we do? And the, that's how we're trying to endeavor to, like, every single decision that we make and correction that we do and discipline that we execute is unto that purpose? That's why I'm hard on my son. That's why I'm hard on him. I don't find pleasure in it. I find none. In a natural sense, in a natural father sense even, I don't derive pleasure from being hard on him and being constantly attentive to his heart's condition. Why? Because it means something. And every little thing within his heart is formulating who he will become. And can we dare say that anyone can rightly be sober enough to say, you know what? Everything matters. Everything matters in us all and especially in the heart of a child. One little white lie is not that. One little, oh, he, he's, you know, I know he's really being deceitful, but is you know, it's kind of sweet. Isn't he funny? He's funny. He's cute. No, no, no. We're talking about the heart of a child that's going to turn into the heart of a man. That I'm telling you, I cannot, I cannot get away from my responsibility as a godly father leaving a heritage to that boy and that I've been entrusted with him to leave him a heritage a lineage and a bloodline that is that is given and prone to yielding his will unto his creator so that when that creator God calls his name and says Noah Daniel I have commands for you, son, that my son says, yes, Lord, here I am. Why? Because he's listened to the training and the discipline of his daddy. Because that's normal for him. It's normal for him to hear the instruction of his father. Yeah, daddy sure is hard. Man, daddy's relentless about training me in the way that I should go. But you know what, y'all? I have faith to believe that that young man is going to look at me one day and say, Dad, thank you. Thank you for training me. Thank you for being hard on me, Dad. Because you know what? Now I'm old enough and I realize this life is hard. It is sacrificial. But it's awesome because it's my purpose. Because I know God. I know Him, Dad. I know Him because you went in before me and you led me up to His throne and you said, Son, this is the eternal God. I know Him. Let me introduce you to Him, Son. And he's holy and righteous. And he is love. And his mercy endures. And his love endures forever. He's full of compassion and loving kindness. He's patient with you, son.
His love knows no bounds. He's pursued you from before you were formed by Him in your mother's womb. Before I even knew I wanted you, son, He knew you and He called you. And y'all, I can't even put into words without completely losing the value within that. And that's why training Him today is not burdensome. And it's not too much and it's not too hard because it's unto an eternal purpose that I am fully convinced I am positioning Him to walk into. It's full of flaws. It's full of failings. It's full of too much and it's full of too little. Of many things. But one thing it's not lacking is zeal. One thing it's not lacking is my absolute strongest best efforts of this now moment, I would like to say confidently, to bring him to the house of the Lord, to bring him to his purpose. Because his purpose is not to be the best anything. I don't care if he goes to college. I don't care if he's the best at whatever vocation he ends up doing and choosing. I really don't care. I don't care if his teeth are straight. I don't care if he has muscles. I don't care if he's the smartest boy. I don't care. Apart from him knowing why he exists, it matters not. Beside that. And that's why every single thing we do matters. What we give ourselves to. What we abstain from. What we wear, where we go, what we see, what we listen to. All of it matters. How he plays with his friends. What his friends say to him how he treats them, how they treat him, how I speak to him, how the brothers relate to him, how he sees the brothers and sisters in our small fellowship. What they say, what they do, what we allow and what we do not absolutely all matters. And I'm telling you, nobody can convince me otherwise. Because it's not of myself. Because I don't know if I can really make this clear in a podcast. Perhaps the people who know me or have known me in the past will be able to understand what I mean by this. If you're a stranger or a distant acquaintance, this won't really mean much. But I know that's right One, because of the confirmation of my heart and the Spirit of God in me confirming it as so. Now, I'm not saying God endorses my parenting because I can write a book about it. I'm not saying I'm attaining perfection. I'm just saying I'm convinced that my heart's intentions are pure and right and good. Now, of course, the outplay is full of flaws. I don't, I don't skirt around that. But number two, confirmation of that, in my perfect world, in my perfect according to the flesh scenario, if I had my own carnal cravings desire, I would still probably just be my family doing whatever we want to do and whatever we seem is best. (laughs) Even if that includes seeking the Lord as we deem best and right. Because we did that for years. We had to. Many of you that listen to this, if it's people that I talk to, I know are in the present, presently in the same boat is like, you're just trying to keep your family spiritually alive. I get it. 
In measure, we're all doing that. But in the context of giving myself and my household to the greater context of the shared body of Christ, the fellowship of believers, it becomes much more complicated. When you try to give yourself to a lifestyle where when you say, to the best of our present understanding, we're not the best demonstration of it, but we're trying. In a perfect world scenario in light of body, shared body life and fellowship, brotherly love, reality, our goal, my goal, is that my son looks at brother so-and-so, and when brother so-and-so says what he says, it's just like daddy says. You know what? Brother so-and-so That's exactly what my daddy believes. You know, that's what my daddy says to me. The unity of the spirit, right? The unity of the brethren. And that brother so-and-so and and sister so-and-so can look to my son and say something to him. And you know what? I I have the absolute blessing and freedom to say amen. Amen. That's truth. That's instruction according to the scriptures. And that's, that's what our household does. And that's what our fellowship does. Amen. Right? The broadening of the familial family of God. Now, we're not there. We're not. I'm you know, I, I don't know. I'm not going to go down this other road about whether other people are or not. I don't know. And I don't believe anybody that I know knows for sure. Because unless we're immersed into a certain situation for, I would say, years, we don't really know what anything is like. We just don't. You know, that, that goes back to the myth of a man stuff that I never, I don't think, ever got to recording like We can listen to someone, we can read their books, we can watch their YouTube videos, we can ingest their teachings, and we might get glimpses into their life or or their ministry or whatever, however it plays out, but until we know them like intimately, until we know them personally, until we are with them, alongside them with a united purpose ongoing, down a road for a while. You know what, y'all? We just don't know. We don't know. And so, a little peek into the, the personal side of my life. Like, we're several years in with a couple families here. And I've seen firsthand the opportunity that I believe is being extended, not just to us, but to the familial fellowship of the people of God, of people who give themselves and their households to one another, present ourselves unto the Lord together, crying out for hearts to literally be knit together under the headship of Jesus the Christ. And many people, I guess, without full explanation of that, would say, well, how in the world does that have anything to do with what you're saying about your son? I don't have time to explain that. And I understand that's a foreign idea to most people, and it was for me for most of my life, although not disconnected whatsoever. Because one thing that's been lost in our culture is, and this permeates Christian culture, is we just go home and we lock our doors and and we just, you know, we got this, right? We got this. This is my family, brother. How are things going? Oh, good. You know, well, we had a major issue. But, you know, we prayed and we're better now. God worked it out. Okay, well... 
I would have liked to have spoken into that matter, friend. Maybe God could have spoken something to me and through me on that. But okay. I'm telling you, that's always within the context of a body of people. The constant trials of laboring to become a unified people. And I don't know why. I I literally don't know why I'm compelled to go down this road right now. I'm just going to tell you this, and this, this is literally how this happens, right? Stick with me. I wanted to record something lighthearted because if you paid attention the first probably 45 seconds of this recording, I was feeling very light. I was going to just, just kind of do some off the cuff commentary on some very light and trivial matters that I felt were somewhat comical. And I was beginning to preface that with, you know what? I've been real serious lately. I cannot shake it. I can't. I cannot avoid the soberness of the call of God on these matters. And I tell you what, even as I say that, I feel like that's a warning of like, man, I don't want to do that. I mean, gosh, isn't it the cry of our hearts to be, oh God, rend our hearts, break us, speak to us, declare your works to us, shake us from our slumber. And then God answers that prayer and like some compartment of me wants to be like, man, everybody wishes, wishes I would just lighten up. You know what? Sometimes I do too, right? But I feel, I feel a conviction about that. I feel a correction about that. I want to, I want to be careful to hold that rightly. And, and I'm not sure I'm, I should really desire that. So may that not be so, if that's not the will of the Lord. Because you know what? I, I mean, I was listening or reading or one, both, I don't know, about some days of Noah stuff, you know, prophecy, end times. Maybe I was just thinking about it when I woke up this morning. I don't even remember. As in the days of Noah, you know, and... There's a lot of things, as in the days of Noah. There was a lot of things going on then. More so than what we're told. Drinking, marrying, you know, living it up. It's not just that. There were a whole heap of problems in the days of Noah. (laughs) But they were just, they were preoccupied, right? Get all you can. Do all you can, man. Live it up. Even if they believe the life was a breath reality, yeah, exactly. We're here and then we're gone, man. Let's do it all. Let's have a good time. Let your kids play and be foolish. Just don't be so hard, man. It's just our lives are like a blade of grass. Burning up and gone. Let's just loosen up. Gosh, it's too hard. I know that's such a temptation. It really is. It's exhausting. And I only have one son. (laughs) It's exhausting with one. But may we be people who give ourselves to these matters. I'm telling you, I just feel such a call for us to just put our hands to the plow. We say that, man. People get all excited and they say it. And Oh my gosh. I just, I, I just kind of wish we would get to a point where we just don't say anything anymore like that. And instead, just do it. Let's just shut our mouths and be found doing it instead of telling God and others we're going to do it. How much greater if we just actually did it instead of just talked about how we're going to So there you go. There's my light and <laughs> my lighthearted thoughts of the evening. My goodness. <sighs> uh, 
I'm captivated. And I don't even know how to put that into words, but it's like when you when you look upon your wife when you begin dating, y'all. And something's just fluttering in your heart. And it's like, wow. Y'all remember that feeling? You remember that feeling? You remember that feeling when you had your firstborn child, should you have had one? Or when you met your spouse in what we call fell in love? Something in you that you didn't even know was there awakened or awakened to a level and a depth that you never knew it existed. That's how I feel about these matters. And if I pretend that things, well, these things aren't that serious. Sorry. I'm just a grump. I'm a liar. I'm a hypocrite if I do that. If I lessen that, I'm a liar. I'm, I would be shrinking back in timidity. And I would be bowing my knee to the fear of man and what people might think of me and and might presume I'm just a jerk. Because if in fact it's the hand of the Lord on my life and I'm in any way, in any way at all, being found obedient to what He's called me to, then it'll be okay. There will be fruit from it, and, and I have to be okay with that. I have to be okay Because that's the pattern of the scriptures too, right? Whether it's the prophets of God or Jesus himself, we're not talking instantaneous fruit in most cases. Sure, there was miraculous, real-time signs and wonders. Absolutely. But we're not necessarily talking about a signs and wonders type work here. We're talking about the long-haul transformation of men and women and children. Undoing patterns, years and generational patterns. Okay? And I'm not saying God can't do that instantaneously with or without any one of us. But it's probably more likely a long haul reality. And so, I'm okay with, well, I don't really see much of anything changing. Not seeing much fruit. In my own household, not much fruit. But I believe it's going to come. It's going to. There will be a a season of reaping what is being sown. And I'm going to tell you, if any one of you have had a garden before, it's, it's, it's fixing to get hot here. In the last couple of years here, we've done what is to us a large garden. And I'm telling you, there's really not much satisfying about going out and weeding a garden when it's 95 degrees in the sun and there's no air moving and you're standing there with a hoe in the dirt. I'm all for weeding a garden when it's 65 and I'm wearing a hoodie. That's awesome. I'd do that all day. But you know what? It's not real desirable in the hard season. Yet necessary just the same. And if done, if labored into, will produce something fruitful in the end. It will affect the outcome at the end of the cycle and season. And I'm not trying to be super spiritual, but I'm just reminded of the parables when Jesus said those things. And when he said to the the disciples about trying to get them to think according to their spiritual man, he said, you see clouds forming on on the horizon, and you know rain's coming. You hear the trees rustling, and you know the wind is about to come, but you don't get anything in the spiritual. You don't see the same principle. You're missing it. Can you not see, talking about things of the kingdom, I want to see the kingdom. I really do. And I'll, and I'll inject a good heavy dose of humility because I don't want to be misunderstood. I know, I know that there's things in my life that hinder that from being more prevalent in my life. I know that. I still, in my own error and in my own rebellion, I slow that process down. I know that. That's true. I'm not the best brother 
to this fellowship here. I'm not. I'm not the best husband. I'm not the husband I could be. Washing my wife with the water of the word and praying over her. Setting her apart spiritually unto her work, her calling. I don't fully give myself in patience to training my son. I don't perfectly honor my father and mother in my heart. I'm full of I'm full of issues. But what I'm beginning to grasp and then I'll wrap this up is like as I study the outset of the people of God, the set apart nation of God, you know what what I just named was not those things being righted was not part of the co- of the covenantal prerequisite of God. God in no way ever said, after you perfect yourself, you can become my people. It's not, it's not according to that pattern. Praise God for his ways that are not that. And so that's what brings me a clear conscience, friends. That's what brings me confidence to boldly enter and come before the throne of God himself is because I know, I know that I know that I know that my heart is towards him. And I'm not ashamed to confidently say that. My heart is towards him. I desire to please him. I desire to labor to present to him all that I am and all that I have. I desire to have that contrite, broken, obliterated heart. And I desire to have clean hands, holy hands that I can lift to Him and Him look at them and receive my offering. And I'm telling you, there's something about that reality and knowing that that is what He is desiring that that gives me some sort of, you know what? I can do this. We can do this. My son is going to do this because his daddy's going to do it. And so, friend, let me just ask you, do you know that? I'm not assuming you don't. I'm not assuming you're not further down the road than I am on that journey. I don't know and I don't claim to. But do you know? Do you just kind of spiritually speaking, have your fingers crossed and are you just hoping that your children get it? I don't want to, I don't want to be too hard on them. I don't want them to grow up hating me. The age old thing, well, I don't want them to have less than I had. I want them to have it all. And Jesus. <laughs> oh. Or are we all saying, I want them to have Jesus. I want them to have an identity in Christ and their banner be Yahweh God upon their life. And anything else after that's just a bonus. And absolutely secondary. And y'all, that's just not something I hope for you. That's the cry of my heart for the people of God on the earth. Literally, it's changed. It's changed from, man, I hope people get this. I hope this makes sense. (laughs) It's so expanded out of that into like the groaning of my heart is that the people who are called according to the name of Christ Jesus come out of their slumber and stupor And have the courage to say, you know what? There's some things I'm missing. And begin to look for the answer. Begin to look for the response of God. The response of a righteous, set-apart, consecrated household. 
And that really is the prayer of my heart. For God's house on this earth, in this hour. Amen.